Dear brother priests and deacons, uh, beloved seminarians who uh, sacrificed to be with us on Super Bowl Sunday to serve Mass, and my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. The direction the Church wants us to go in today's scripture reflections is found in the opening prayer. So I'd like to pray that again with you so we might kind of discover the direction the Church wants us to think. This is the prayer. Keep your family safe, O Lord, with unfailing care, that relying solely on the hope of heavenly grace, they may be defended always by your protection. Now, as we hear those uh, words, uh, the question I ask myself and I ask you is, what family does this, does this prayer refer to? We pray that the Lord would, would um, keep his family safe. I think the first thing, of course, we think about is our, our husband, our wife, our children, our parents. But the family that the church is asking us to reflect on here is the family of the church community. And so the question that comes naturally to mind is, do we think upon the church or think of the church as our family? Or is the church something else? And if we think about the church as our family that we ask God to protect, we need to think of one another as our sister or our brother. And that's the church. The church is our family of faith. And if the church is something else less than that, then it isn't the way that, that the church and God wants us to think about the community. Now, every time, every morning when I get up, I look at my ring. The bishop's ring is a symbol of his marriage to the diocese. And so I have an occasion every day to think about you as my family. And when I put that ring on, as a husband would put on the ring of his marriage, I am reminded of my commitment to you. But we need also to make that commitment in our own hearts to the church, to see it as our family, especially in difficult times. And as we all know, the family of the Church of Philadelphia is having difficult times. In fact, we can probably just see ourselves as a church community, as a, the family of Christ here in southeastern Pennsylvania, in today's first reading from the Old Testament, from the book of Job, where Job describes a situation that many of us experience personally, but I think that the Church of Philadelphia is, is, is experiencing as a family. Listen again to these words. Job spoke saying, Is not man's life on earth a drudgery? Are not his days those of a hireling, a hired slave? So I have been assigned months of misery, and trouble nights have been allotted to me. If in bed I say, when shall I get up? When's the night going to pass? Then the night drags on. I am filled with restlessness until the dawn. And then the opposite. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. They come to an end without hope. Remember that my life is like the wind. I shall not see happiness again. Pretty sad, what Job describes here. Now this reading is from the Old Testament, from the collection of, of inspired scripture, which is called wisdom literature. And the wisdom literature is the kind of the natural reflections of human beings on the meaning of our life. Of course, guided by the Holy Spirit, because we believe the Old Testament, like the New Testament, is the word of God. But nonetheless, the experience that Job describes is the human experience that all of us have at one time or another. That life is difficult, it seems very, uh, and sometimes very hard and burdensome. It seems to go on and on, and it seems like it'll never end. And then we get older and come to the ends of our life, and it seems like it passes too quickly. And we ask ourselves, is our life have meaning. 
Now, the reason the church gives us this reading as our first reading today is that it leads us into the gospel. On, on first look, it might not seem like there's any connection between one and the other. In the gospel, of, which is a passage from the gospel of St. Mark, we have a description of Jesus healing the sick and driving out demons. And the reason why the church has given us that first reading is because the church wants us to see in today's gospel reading an antidote to that despair that's described in the book of Job. If our lives seem burdensome, the antidote to that burden drudgery is Jesus Christ. If our life seems worthless, not worthwhile, the answer to that despair and depression is our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at today's gospel reading. On leaving the synagogue, Jesus entered the house of Simon and Andrew, who were brothers, with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. Now Simon is St. Peter, right? So here we have a description of St. Peter's home, and at the center of the home is St. Peter's mother-in-law, which means that St. Peter, the first pope, was married. It's just interesting to, to, to think about the detail of today's gospel reading. You know, oftentimes we make joke about mother and mother-in-laws, right? How many of you are mother-in-laws, if you just raise your hand? A few of you here, not too many tonight. And people make jokes about mother-in-laws. But a mother-in-law is a very important part of a person's family. So it's very important that we don't make jokes about our mother-in-laws, that we respect them. But it's also very important that those of you who are mothers-in-law are good mothers-in-law. That means that you understand that your son or your daughter, whichever it might be that's married to another person, primarily is a member of that person's family. And it's very important if you're a mother-in-law to really support the choice of your child in his or her marriage. And then to support that relationship with devotion and love. So here we have St. Peter inviting Jesus to his home, and the mother-in-law who's present there, like all the women of this time in, in human history, in the, in, the, uh, in the land of Palestine, were expected to be the center of hospitality for those who came to the family. And here she is sick. So they approached Jesus and told him about her. Then Jesus approached her, grasped her hand, and helped her up. Then the fever left her, and she waited on them. So Jesus is the antidote to this poor woman's illness. And her response to the presence of Jesus in her life is, is in this simple scripture passage, a pattern of discipleship. From the healing that God gives us follows service to others. Now, some people might say, well, that's the way women were treated back in those days. But whether we're women or men, the response of a disciple to the healing power of Jesus in our life is that we get up and we help other people. It's not the role of a woman or the role of a man. It's the role of a disciple of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the antidote to this woman's illness. And the antidote to struggles that we have in our lives. Reflecting on this passage, St. Jerome, who was a, a saint of the church in about the fourth century after the uh, birth of Christ, said this in response to, the, to reading this passage. He said, Would that Jesus would come to our house and enter and heal the fever of our sins by his command. For each and every one of us suffers from fever. When I grow angry, I am feverish. So many vices, so many fevers. But let us ask the apostles to call upon Jesus to come to us and touch our hands. For if he touches our hands, the fevers flee. So we place ourselves into the heart of this gospel and we ask the Lord to do for us what he did for Peter's mother-in-law. 
to heal us of the fevers of our sins, to pull us up and then send us in service to our brothers and sisters. But Jesus wasn't satisfied with healing Peter's mother-in-law. This, the passage goes on to say, the whole town was gathered at the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases, and he drove out many demons, not permitting them to speak because they knew him. Jesus desires to do this not only for us, but for everyone else. It's a sign of the coming of the kingdom of God that illness is cured and demons are driven out. Now, let's reflect for a moment on the various fevers in our lives. Human beings have struggles and problems. And one of the tendencies we have as human beings is to medicate those problems and difficulties. When we struggle, we look for escape. And we're tempted to escape in the wrong way. Drugs, alcohol, pleasure. You know, one of the uh, passages in the scripture that we all know from memory is a, is a description of what it's like without God when, it's, when the scriptures tell us that they ate, drank, and were merry. As a, in the scriptures, those words are a sign of people who live a life of the absence of God who eat too much, who drink too much, and the word merry is a euphemism, actually, to be merry, which is, it means in the scriptures to be engaged in unlawful co uh, relationships, sexual relationships with other people. And that's a tendency in the human heart when we have struggles and difficulties, when we feel like Job in today's first reading, to find a way out through, through means that really don't satisfy us or make us whole. It's not only drugs and alcohol and, and sensual pleasure. We also escape by distractions. We look for vacations, or we spend time shopping, or um, we spend too much time in front of the television. And there's all kinds of ways we try to medicate our, our discomfort and satisfy the longings of our heart. Today's scripture readings are a reminder to you and to me that the only real antidote for the anxiety and despair described in the book of Job is Jesus Christ. We also know that some people, people who aren't believers, refer to religion as the opium of the people or the masses, that somehow religion sometimes is an escape from the difficulties of this world. Instead of dealing with those difficulties, they tell us that religious people, like you and I, who are here on Super Bowl Sunday at Mass, religious people escape the problems of the world by entering into this relationship with God, which isn't, in the minds of unbelievers, real at all. And in some few circumstances, they could be right. You know, we can substitute uh, our life with God to the reality of really dealing with the problems of our life or dealing with the problems in the world around us. For example, if we never really help other people who are struggling and we make the excuse that we don't have time for that because we have to spend time with God, we would be escaping from the reality of the world into what um, unbelievers recall, refer to as the opium of the masses. God demands a whole lot from us. He demands a right relationship with him, but he also demands that we have a right relationship with one another. And we find that also in today's gospel. You know, in, in the, at the end of this, of this passage, once Jesus has cured and, and uh, healed and driven out the demons, we're told that early in the morning before the sun rose, he went off by himself to pray because he, he saw that the source of the good that he was doing was that right relationship with God. But then because of the demands of the world, the needs of the people around him, we're told that Simon, Peter, came running up to Jesus and he said to him, everyone is looking for you. And in response to that, um, those words of St. Peter, Jesus said this, let us go to, on to the nearby villages 
that I may preach there also. And Jesus was telling Peter that his responsibility was to go with Jesus to the world where people had those needs. Jesus didn't go by himself, but he took his disciples with him. Which is a reminder to us that we have obligations of our relationship with God, but then that drives us, as it drove Jesus, to go with Jesus in the service of our brothers and our sisters. So we ask ourselves as we are confronted with the Word of God today, what does this demand for me in my life? Because God is always asking something from us when we hear His Word proclaimed in the Scriptures. Jesus is the antidote to the human struggles of life. A right relationship with Jesus in some way balances out all the struggles of human life. They don't go away necessarily. Things don't necessarily get better. Sometimes they get worse. But if we have a right relationship with the Lord Jesus, we're able to deal with the struggles of life with hope and confidence because we know that God loves us. God loves us. He cares for us. No matter what happens eventually in our lives, we know that there's victory because Jesus has been raised from the dead. And just as he raised up the mother-in-law of St. Peter, Jesus will also raise you up and raise me up because of his great love for us. One final reflection on uh, today's second reading is from that ongoing, um, those ongoing passages from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. For us to understand um, some of these uh, scripture passages, we have to understand that they are answers to questions that were asked by people in the early church. Apparently, people had sent questions to St. Paul about their life as Christians in Corinth. And one of the questions that they asked was, is it lawful for us as Christians to eat meat that was sacrificed to false gods, to idols? And today's second reading is an answer to that question. It, you wouldn't know that by just reading the short passage that we have from this section from uh, the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. But there are two issues involved here. We know that there are no other gods than the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So idols don't exist. I and mean, there's no such thing as, as false gods. They're, they're, the, they're part of the imagination of human beings. So to eat meat that was offered to these, to these non-realities was seen by some members of the early church as an, a non-consequential issue. Of course we can eat it, they would say because these false gods don't exist. So those who offered this meat to the idols were just um, doing foolish and imaginary things. Others in the church were saying, and this is what St. Paul is saying here, that it may be true that those idols don't exist, but there's a danger if you meet, eat the meat offered to idols that you'll scandalize your brother and sister Christians who are weaker than you are, who don't understand things clearly, and who think that somehow you're participating in the worship of idols by consuming that meat. And St. Peter, St. Paul rather said, in response to the danger of scandalizing others, it's important that we be careful. That we don't just think of ourselves, but we think of the impact of what we do on others. That we have to be very cautious that in our actions we don't drive other people away from Christ or lead them into error. And that's why St. Paul said things that we hear and we remember from Scripture. St. Paul says, I have become all things to all to save at least some. St. Paul is saying that we have to be, make sure that as we live the life of Christians, we take into account our relationship with other people and we take into account where they might be and what they might know and what they might understand. But St. Paul also says in this passage, Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. And no matter what we do, when we try to be all things to all people, it's also very important that we are insistent on living and preaching the gospel without compromise. And we ask the Lord in today's celebration of the Eucharist to help us to do that. We ask Jesus to be the antidote of the anxiety in our life. And we ask him to be the energy that takes, that he might take us with him as he goes throughout our world 
continuing to preach the good news. May God bring to completion in our lives the good news of today's gospel readings.